Assalamu alaikum. Um, for those of you who are here, obviously for the lecture, and for those of the people who are not able to attend, if you want to text them, um, on the IEGD website, IEGD.net, um, this uh, lecture is, you can hear it live. Uh, and that will be for any of the uh, lectures that we have, whether it's khutbahs or tarawi or any of the uh, other programs that we have. So if you go to IEGD.net um, and you can text that to uh, family members, they can go ahead and listen to this as we speak. أعوذ بالله السميع العليم من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله والحمد لله والصلاة والسلام على سيدنا رسول الله وعلى آله وصحبه ونوله وأشهد أن لا إله إلا الله وحده لا شريك له وأشهد أن محمدا عبده ورسوله صلى الله عليه وعلى آله وأصحابه أجمعين اللهم لا سهل إلا ما جعلته سهلا وأنت إن شئت تجعل الحزن سهلا اللهم إنا نعوذ بك من أن نشرك بك شيئا نعلمه ونستغفرك لما لا نعلمه ثم أما بعد Every year, uh, in the last 10 days of Ramadan, we choose a series of lectures on something. And we, uh, one year, we covered the seer of the Prophet وسلم, very briefly. Um, and the other two years, we work on some Sahaba every day. We talk about the biography of one of the Sahaba. And this year, we decided to um, have some knowledge uh, on the four Imams. And when we say four Imams, what we are talking about when we say when you hear the word four imams okay maliki is not the name of the imam if the name of the madhab right the name of the madhab is not the name of the imam okay these are the four imams are they the only imams in islam there are plenty of genius scholars and what are they scholars at? What kind of, what the field of their scholarship? What is the field of their scholarship? What is, huh? It is fiqh, right? So we are talking about four imams who established or um, founded four madahib in fiqh, right? So we need just to understand that we are talking about fiqh only. Um, we're not talking about Islamic um, theology or faith. We're not talking about Islamic history. We're not talking about Islamic philosophy. We're not talking uh, about uh, uh, hadith. Although all these things are interlinked, but we are focusing more on the field of fiqh. And fiqh means Islamic law, right? So why is it important to know the biography or study the lives of these four imams? Why is it important for us today? Is it important to know more about them? Why is that? Why is it important to study their sira, their life? are fighting with each other that's 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 I would just pick this word <laughs> and we are fighting with each other. it's important to know that plenty of opinions are plenty of thoughts and um, and 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 th this this word reflects an important answer to this question why do we need to study their lives and that um, I would say it, I have to say that this is just an appetizer it's we are cannot in this short period of time to study everything about their lives we are going to just encourage you to read more and to dig deep and to try to understand um, the uh, the methodologies of these scholars one of the most important reasons why we should study the life of these four great imams is um, that there are plenty of opinions um, regarding these imams and as one historian said that if you want to know the significance of the influence of someone see how many people hate him and how many people love him and if you have this dichotomy then this means that this person is very influential this is one way to measure the importance of a person right the influence he has and how many people love him so much and how many people hate him so much and this applies to every one of the imams that we're going to talk about right 
Imam Abu Hanifa, for example, many people consider him to be almost a prophet. Ma'soom. Whatever he says is the absolute truth. And on the other hand, some people consider him Zandiq. He is a way of the Sunnah. He is the enemy of the Sunnah. They used to call him that, the enemy of the Sunnah, of the Prophet. I will explain to you why. Tomorrow, not today. Because today we are not going to start talking about in details. But today is just a general idea about um, uh, their biography. Um, um, and also, uh, Imam Shafi'i and Imam Malik and Imam Ahmad, all of them were considered the protectors of Islam. On the other hand, the destroyers of Islam. Some people consider them, you know, um, infallible. Others consider them enemies of the Sunnah of the Prophet ﷺ. And this gives you an idea about how extreme people um, ought to be or, 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 or tend to be, right? So for us as Muslims, when we love and hate, we don't love and hate based on just following what the crowd, what people say, we just say. No, we need to study it. When, when you see or hear people speaking very negatively about someone, say, why, why is that? Did you study his opinion? Did you get the chance to listen to him? Did you read his books? Most of the people don't. No, we don't read his books, but we just hate him. Why? Because everybody around us hates him. Everybody dislikes him, so we have to dislike him. Or everybody likes this person. Why do you like him so much? Uh, because everybody likes him. Did you read his books? No, we don't read. This is the problem. We don't read enough. We don't read. And if we read ourselves, we do our homework, or we study and investigate, then we will get the chance to form a, an objective uh, picture about this person and his opinions. As much as we love and respect our imams very much, these four imams in particular, we also believe that they are human beings. They are, not, uh, they are fallible. They, are, they make mistakes. They change their opinion. They established a methodology of way of searching for the truth in Islamic law, and sometimes they found out they were wrong, and they say we are wrong. We change our opinion. Imam Abu Hanifa, when he was asked, is what you say is the absolute truth? Everybody, everything else is wrong. And there's no doubt in what you say. He said, no, it could be the absolute doubt that there's no certainty. In other words, what I say is my opinion. Could be right, could be wrong. But as for now, I believe this is what's right. If you got a hadith that I did not get, if you heard another opinion that's better than my opinion, follow the other opinion. They never said you have to follow me. If you don't follow me, I will not be with you in the day of judgment or you'll be on your own or something like this. They never ever said that. And by the way, and this could be a surprise to many of you, when they were working and writing and thinking and teaching, they never ever thought of establishing a madhab that would be followed by millions of people. Let me say it again. They were just one of many scholars. They were teaching like millions of other scholars teaching, right? But they never thought that it will end up that four madahib and Muslims from that point until the day of judgment were, are required to follow one of these four madahib. They never thought of founding a madhab the way we understand the word madhab today. Right? They're mujtahideen. They reached the level of ijtihad. But scholarship is, is levels. Let me, let me mention this very quickly. There is a muqallid and mujtahid. Muqallid means follower. Follower. We are not mujtahid because we are not specialists, right? If you, if you have a health issue, you go to a specialist, a doctor, right? Because he knows how to treat you. If you have a case in the court, then you go to a lawyer because he knows the law and the procedures and all these things. You don't know any of these things. And you don't have time to study all these things. So that's why you have to go to a lawyer, right? So people are two kinds, either muqallid or mujtahid. And mujtahid is mujtahid juz'i or mujtahid mutlaq. Mujtahid mutlaq means that he can make ijtihad, he can himself find the rules from reading the Quran and the Sunnah, he can reach the conclusion, come up with a fatwa, not following someone else. No, he himself can go read the Quran, the Sunnah and study and then find the conclusion. These four Imams are in the top 
of these levels. So they are the Mujtahideen and so many other great Imams followed them. There are also great Imams, but they decided to follow these four Imams. So one, back to the question, why, one of the main reasons why we study the life of these four Imams is to be objective, not to fight with each other based on the Madhab, what Madhab you follow and what Madhab I follow. We need to appreciate the great effort that these great Imams established. And we need also to study not only their fiqh opinions, but we need also to know their personality. Very important to know their personality. Because when we talk about Hanafi or Shafi'i or Maliki, we always think about the law as, like, as we think about a professor teaching in the university. But we don't know anything about his life. We know him in the classroom. Teaching is a brilliant professor. We enjoy his lectures, but what does he do outside? Right? We don't know. And similarly, when it comes to our Imams, it's not only their effort in the classroom. Number of issues that we need to also shed some light on. One is their taqwa. Very, very important. Their ibadat and their taqwa and their um, uh, consciousness of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. They are not just uh, uh, professors teaching and they have nothing to do with ibadat and Quran and uh, dhikr and all these things. No, we need to know what kind of ibadah they used to do and what kind of akhlaq they had. The other important point is that they were not disconnected from, their, from what's going on around them. Were they involved in politics? Of course. They were very much involved in politics. Did they suffer as a result of that? Absolutely. And we will talk about this. We'll talk about how much they suffered. Why do they have to suffer? Because they're influential, they are very powerful, they are followed by so many people, they're very smart. So politicians always like to take these Imams to their side, right? Because it's influential. The fatwa comes out of the mouth of Imam Malik or Imam Abu Hanifa or Imam Shafi. It has a very heavy weight, right? Right? So every politician wants to take them to their side. See, you know, this Imam is in our side. Listen to him. By listening to him, you are listening to us as politicians. And sometimes, most of the time, as we will see, these Imams, because they have taqwa, and they have Iman, they were not um, um, uh, bowed to these uh, politicians or political authority. They said the truth, and as a result, they suffered. And this reflects the amount of taqwa they have. They understand the amana of knowledge. Knowledge is amana. If you say what the politicians want, then you are giving up this amana. You are not keeping, preserving this amana. You are wasting it. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gave you this amana of knowledge and you have to keep it. Because they have great amount of taqwa and iman. They did not say what the hukam or the, the uh, political authority wants them to say. Right? And we need also to know about their social life. Their social life. Uh, were they married? Did they have children? How they treated their wives and children and so on and so forth. Um, another important, very extremely important thing that we need to know about them is not only their opinion. We can tell the opinions of, you know, Hanafi or Shafi'i in how, where to put your hand in Salah and um, how to make wudu. This is what we study in fiqh. So if you want to know about this, you come Friday between Maghrib and Isha, after Ramadan, inshallah, to know about this as we have this uh, regular class. But what's more important is to know their methodology. Because the, these opinions are different because they have different methodologies. Imam Abu Hanifa established a methodology. Say, okay, this methodology is like a machine. The input is the question. The output is the fatwa or the opinion. And this machine is the methodology. I'm going to think this way, the way of thinking, how to process the ijtihad, looking at the question and how to come up with an answer, right? This methodology is very important. I will try it, inshallah, to simplify it as much as I can. But it's very important to know why Imam Abu Hanif is different from Malik and Malik is different from Shafi and Shafi is different from Ahmad. Why is that? Why all the outcome is different? It's because the methodology is different. 
And you will appreciate this methodology very much when you read and how, see how deep, sophisticated it is and how systematic they try to be and how consistent they try to be. And as a result of that, if someone wants to be a Maliki or Hanafi or Shafi'i or Hanbali, you need to know the methodologies of these four. And you know what? I think this methodology is better. This, this system is good. Then I will be Shafi'i. This is how, how big scholars chose to be Shafi'i or Malik or Hanafi. They chose based on understanding the methodology. And I like this more than this. So this methodology is good. Then I'll decide to be Malik. Because I like the methodology of Malik. Makes a lot of sense. So, again, we study their life when they were born and when they died, personal life, and we need to know about their taqwa, about their involvement in the so social and political um, uh, uh, life, and their methodology. How they formed this methodology that they look at every question through this methodology. That's what, according to us, Hanafi, we do it this way. Okay. According to us, Shafi'i, we do it this way. You need also to know that there are two kinds of schools of thought when it comes to fiqh. One is called the school of Al-Athar and the school of Al-Ra'i. Al-Athar Al means the narration. Athar means the hadith, yani, okay, the, so many narrations. And the other school is called the school of Ar-Ra'i. Ar-Ra'i means the opinion. This is the literal meaning of it. But it also refers to the intellectual effort made to reach a conclusion. Imam Malik, for example, he is the Imam of Ahlul Athar. He was born and died in Medina. Right? And he um, was the second generation. And he met some of the Sahaba. And he memorized tons of hadith and he was very strict on hadith and he knows the fatawa of Abu Bakr and fatwa of Umar and Uthman ibn Abbas ibn Mas'ud. So he has like a huge bank of a hadith that reflects the saying of the Prophet Sallallahu and the fatawa of the Sahaba and, and, the, and, 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 and their, their judgments. So when you ask him a question, he said, yes, based on the hadith, so and so, the fatwa is so and so. so or based on the fatwa of Ibn Mas'ud, he gives the fatwa, right? But the people in Iraq where Abu Hanifa, Allah, was born and died in Al-Kufa, still, by the way, his mosque, there is a great mosque in a place called Al-Azamiyya, Azamiyya in Kufa. Azamiyya, the word Azamiyya is the name of the neighborhood. It came after the name Imam Al-Azam. You know, the word Imam Al-Azam, when you hear the word Imam Al-Azam, Imam Al-Azam, it refers to Abu Hanifa. So he's, he, he was buried there and there's a huge mosque uh, there, uh, still uh, there up until now. The people of Iraq, they don't have this huge amount of athar, hadith, or narrations. So when you ask a question, then they have to find another way to issue a fatwa. What's the other way? It's intellectual effort. That's called qiyas. Qiyas means analogy. They use analogy. I will explain to you this, inshallah, when we talk about Abu Hanifa in particular. So, based on the Quran, uh, in addition to the Quran and the Hadith, they established some mechanisms that help them to issue fatwa. One of which is Al Qiyas, or analogy. Very briefly, what's Al Qiyas? Al Qiyas is to find something mentioned in the Quran or Hadith that has a hukm and to apply this rule to everything that's similar to it. Like, uh, we'll always give the example of heroin. Is heroin halal? Are you sure? Are you sure? Did the Quran say it's haram? Did the Sunnah say it's haram? Okay. So where do you get this haram from? Why are you so certain that... Uh, I'm not, I didn't say it's halal yet. <laughs> but what makes you sure that it is not halal? Yes. About the Quran talked about khamr. And I uh, did not talk about the so many other things. So now by using analogy, we say, okay, 
Al-Khamr is mentioned in Quran because it causes people to get intoxicated. Right? Okay. If something else other than Al-Khamr, right, makes people intoxicated, would it be also haram? They said yes, based on the analogy, because there is similarity. What is the similarity between Al-Khamr and any other intoxicant privilege is intoxication. So there is a clear similarity here. So this takes the rule of this. And this is called Qiyas. And based on this, millions of opinions were made because of analogy. So they are called the school of ar rai the people of intellectual effort. So we have school of al athar you know, in, in Medina and Mecca and Hijaz area, and the school of ar rai the opinion, right, established in Iraq. And that's why they used to accuse Imam Abu Hanifa, rahimahullah, as the enemy of the Sunnah. The hadith is there, and you are issuing fatwa against the hadith because of your opinion. And of course, that's not true, as we will see, inshallah, when we talk about Imam Abu Hanifa in details. So, back to the question. Um, people used to exaggerate so much about the great Imams. To the point where the lovers of an imam, they write a hadith, or they say a hadith, or they say the Prophet mentioned him by name, or the Prophet anticipated that this imam will come, um, or um, claiming that what he says is the absolute truth. And as I said, the others, they accuse him of being ignorant, um, uh, stupid, Again, is the Sunnah and so on and so forth. Up until now, up until now, people accuse Abu Hanifa of being against the Sunnah because those who do not study his life. So, to be objective, we need to study um, and to need to, need to um, know um, um, uh, about their life and their opinions. We also need to understand the adab al ikhtilaf, adab al ikhtilaf, how to disagree um, and keep our brotherhood at the same time. There is adab of ikhtilaf. And when we study the life of these great imams, it will help us significantly to develop this adab al ikhtilaf. These great imams were not only great in knowledge, but they were also great in taqwa and iman and understanding. And they used to respect each other so significantly. And if I would put it this way, the more knowledge we have, the more tolerant we'll be. The more knowledge we have, the more tolerant we'll be. And the less knowledge we have, the more intolerant we'll be. And this applies to all people at all times. You know that people used to fight, fight, literally fight. Shafi'i and Maliki, and Maliki and, and, and Shafi'i and, 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 uh, and, and Hanafi and so on. These people used to fight. They used to fight. Imam Shafi'i, as we will say, he was actually killed by Maliki people because he issued fatwas against their madhab in Egypt. And they did not like him. And we, when he was going to pray Salat al-Fajr, they were waiting for him. And with sticks, they kept hitting him. These are how intolerant people were at that time because they were ignorant. But these great imams and their students and the students of the students, they were very tolerant. And they love each other, they used to make dua to one another. Imam al-Shafi'i said about Abu Hanif, although Imam al-Shafi'i is a student of Malik, right? Hijaz area. But he said about Abu Hanifa, nasu fil ala Abu Hanif. The scholars are Iyal, the word Iyal. Have you heard the word, word Iyal before? Wajadaka Ailan. Iyal means your, your children. If you, if, you are, if you have children, your children is your iyal. They are dependent on you. Right? So your children, young children, are your iyal because they are fully dependent on you. Right? So he said, scholars are iyal in fiqh to Abu Hanif. This is Imam Shafi saying this about Imam Abu Hanif. Right? In other words, Abu Hanif is the father. Is, is, the, is the father of, of this, right? Of fiqh. So if you are a scholar in fiqh, you need Abu Hanifa like young children need their father. This is what Imam Shafi'i said about Abu Hanifa. This is how much they love each other and pray for each other. And as I mentioned before, Imam Ahmad ibn Hanbal, the fourth one, 
His son said to him, I heard you so many times talking about a Shafi, praying for a Shafi, quoting a Shafi. Why is that? He said, my son, a Shafi to the people is like the sun. Do you think anybody can live without the sun? A Shafi is the sun to this world and health to the body. So this is how much they love each other and respect each other and, and, and appreciate one another. Of course they disagree, but they still pray to each other and love each other. So it's not like, like, like they were like fighting and um, they hate each other and they think um, that they hold the absolute truth and everybody else was wrong. So one important reason why we should study their life is to know not only about their opinions, but to know about their methodology, about their taqwa and iman, about their faith, and to know about their involvement in the political dynamics, um, and also um, uh, to be objective about uh, and to develop this tolerance um, when it comes to the madhahib. Very briefly, Imam Abu Hanifa, he was born in Al Kufa in the year 84. I'm going to use the Hijri calendar. Um, if you want to know the, the, uh, the common era uh, uh, calendar, then you add approximately about 600 years. So he was born on the year 84, and he met about eight of the Sahab, including Anas ibn Malik. When Anas ibn Malik lived so long. He lived for 90, uh, he died in the year 91 Hijra. Hijra. So Imam Hamifa, he met Imam, uh, Anas ibn Malik and other Sahab. And he died in the year 150 of Hijra in Kufa. Interestingly, the same year, 150, is the same year when Imam Shafi'i was born. And some even claim that Imam Abu Hanifa died in the same day when Imam Shafi'i was born. So one great Imam died and one great Imam was born. We will study Imam Abu Hanifa first because he is the first one age-wise. Um, and then Imam Malik. Imam Malik was 13, almost, almost 10 years um, uh, younger than Imam Abu Hanifa. He was born in year 93, Fidra, but he lived almost 30 years after Imam Abu Hanifa. He died in the year 179, 179 of Al Hijra. Imam, Imam Abu Hanifa died 150, and he died. Imam Malik died in 179, almost 30 years after Imam Abu Hanifa. And this allows the students of Imam Abu Hanifa to be also the students of Imam Malik. Because they lived, I mean, 30 years of a great Imam like Malik is, is plenty of time. And you can imagine the amount of knowledge um, um, he had um, and he taught after Imam Abu Hanifa. Imam al-Shafi'i, as, as I mentioned, he was born in what year? 150, right? The same year when Imam Ahinifa died. Very important on these dates. Imam al-Shafi'i was born 150 and he died. You know how, how long was Imam, Abu, uh, Imam al-Shafi'i? You'll be surprised. He lived only for 54 years. This great Imam al-Shafi'i lived only 54 years and may Allah forgive those who killed him. Imagine if Imam Shafi'i lived another 20 years or 30 years. How much knowledge would have had? Because of their intolerance, extremism, they killed him. After they beat him, he died like four years after this. How brilliant he was to produce all this knowledge only in 50. So he was born 150, died in 204. Very easy to know. 150, 204. Imam Ahmad ibn Hanbal, he was um, uh, almost 14 years younger than Imam Shafi. He was born 164, and he died in 241. 241. You can say that the three Imams, Malik, Shafi, and Ahmad, were Ahlul Athar, because they rely heavily on hadith and narrations and so on. And Imam Abu Hanifa is the father of Ahlul Ra'i, the school of Ra'i, the intellectual effort and intellectual um, opinion.
Any questions so far? Abu Hanifa, he, you make the calculation. He was born in 84, okay, 84, and died 150. So about 66 years. 60, 66, or? right, right. Um, it's still considered young, but uh, yes. Uh, well, um, actually, um, as we will say, inshallah, about Abu Hanifa, he was tortured and imprisoned by the government, the political authority, Abu Ja'far Mansur. And we'll explain why I don't want to spoil tomorrow's lecture, inshallah. So, but he was actually, he, he suffered by the government because they want to take him to his side by giving him great job great position to be in their side and he refused and that's why he has been tortured um, but all these imams have been hated many people dis dislike them including the political authority but they try to keep a huge distance between them and the government because they know so well once you take their job once you work for them you have to say, to say what pleases them and you are no longer objective scholar and this is scholarship scholarship means that you have to stay away from any pressure you know the the, the stick and the carrot you stay away from this unfortunately one of the major problems we have with Islamic scholarship is that many scholars or da'i or imams or speakers are under the influence of three kind of influence or pressure the pressure of the government the pressure of the people and the pressure nowadays of businessmen the pressure of the politicians is very obvious once you are influential imam good speaker millions of people follow you on facebook all right um, hundreds of people come to listen to you in, in a huge conference now the politicians will try to again use you Put pressure on you and that's huge pressure don't think it's like, like one person to know it's a huge pressure sometimes threaten them of killing their children or or imprisoning them or, or or something else or they attract them by giving them plenty of money like in the gulf area it's because they you know they, they the amount of money and privilege and houses and it's huge it's huge People are people. Humans are humans. You know, if you are a scholar and you get all these millions of dollars or thrown in prison, well, of course you'd rather to do what they want to do and pray for them and so on. This is the first pressure. The second kind of pressure is the pressure that comes from the people. If you want to be a public speaker or an imam or a scholar and you want to say something that you think the community is doing something wrong and you want to change it, you know very well that people not like it. And as a result, you may lose your job. And as a result, nobody will come to listen to you. And as a result, people are going to spread rumors against you. They will say that it's against the Sunnah. Okay? Your ibadah will be invalid if you follow him. So, it's easier to say what people want to hear. Right? If you are an imam or a new imam to a community that's very, very Sufi community, you cannot criticize Sufism. You better just say what they like to say. And this is what we are doing. I'm not talking about me, I'm talking about in general. This is what people say. If you are going to a Salafi masjid, you better be Salafi. Because people like what you say, okay, you are at peace. If you are going to a community that, uh, you know, uh, have a particular um, orientation then you don't challenge the status quo keep everything as as it is if you start saying something new although you think it's better people start you know talking negatively about you um, and uh, they will just turn away from you and then you'll lose your job so why all these troubles al-imam al-subki was uh, one of these great scholars 
He is a great scholar. He could be the fifth Imam, not one of the followers of the four. He could be a fifth or a sixth. Why then he has to be Shafi'i? Why he has to be called Shafi'i? Why? Well, he could be an independent scholar. When he asks his Imam, um, when someone asks his Imam, why Imam Suki is not an independent Imam? Um, is it because that he wants to get a job? And, and his teacher said, he nodded his head, meaning yes. Because in the time and the place where you're living, you have to be one of these four. In order to get a job as a judge or as a professor or a teacher, you have to be one of these four. This is the situation. This is, this is what it is. So the pressure of the political authority, the other p pressure that comes from the people, that's why reformists are the most hated people. If you are a reformist, if you want to really reform the understanding of the people, people will always act like these four Imams, I consider them to be great reformers. Rasulullah said, every 100 years, Allah will send someone to renew the religion for the people. What does this mean? Does this mean that he will bring a new Islam? No, because people tend to just go away from the teaching of the Prophet and someone will come to bring them back to it. It's called renovation or reform or revival. Someone needs to come and say, people, what you're doing is wrong, let's go back to the right way. And people will not like him. And people try to even to kill him. So a real scholar is the one who stay out of this pressure of the political authority and out of the pressure of the people. You write what you think is the right thing. And I mentioned this story before I will mention it again. Imam Yusuf al-Qarabawi, Hafizahullah, is 86 years old now. One of the most knowledgeable people on earth today. One of the top uh, scholars. I remember uh, I attended a conference in Europe and at the dinner table I sat with him, a bunch of other people, and he told us this story. I, I heard it from him. That he wrote a book called Al-Halal wal Haram al Islam. He was a young scholar in Azhar. Azhar told him, write about these questions. People ask these questions so many times. Why don't you just write a book to answer these questions? Um, you know, about so many things, the most frequently asked questions. So he collected these questions and he took the task to write, uh, you know, to give fatwa about these questions and printed the book called Al-Halal. He named it Al-Halal wal Haram. And I think that people who are old enough here studied in Sunday school. Yeah, and this book has been translated into all, all, almost all languages. That was 45, 50 years ago. Still, the book is available and people like it. And he mentioned some opinions about music, for example, and about having men and women in one uh, place, like the social hall we have, the monthly dinner or lectures or stuff like that, called ikhtilat. Of course, in Saudi Arabia, they don't like these opinions. Music is absolutely haram, all together. And men and women cannot stay in one place. There must be a full separation between the two. So he said, Sheikh bin Baz, Hafizahullah, he was the, the, the Grand Mufti of Saudi Arabia. Um, he called me. He was a very nice person. He was blind, Rahimahullah, uh, but has a, a, amazing knowledge. So they decided not to print or to allow this book to be sold in Saudi Arabia. For, for any book to be sold, it has to be stamped by the ulama there. So they refused because of these opinions. He said, he called me one day and he said, uh, Sheikh Yusuf, I, um, how are you doing and so on. And he said, I want to okay this book, but would you please just change these two fatwas about music and about men and women in one place, ikhtilat, called ikhtilat. And Sheikh Yusuf al-Qaradawi said that I told him, um, you know, you know, as a scholar, that you make your ishtihad, you study, 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 and then the opinion that you think is the right opinion is the one that you give fatwa uh, uh, upon. You give fatwa based on your conviction, your understanding not based on the understanding of someone else, because you respect other fatawa, but you give fatwa based on what you think is the right thing. And he said, so far, this is what I think to be the truth. Um, until this change, this is, I'm, I'm not willing to change this. And whether you allow the book to be 
sold in Saudi Arabia or not, um, uh, this is amana. This is my opinion, and I'm not going to change it. He said, Jazakum Allah khairan, I understand this. And he allowed the book to be sold in Saudi Arabia because his objective is faith. So, Sheikh Yusuf Qaradawi narrated this story in the context of praising Sheikh Bin Baz. And he said, after this short conversation, he said, yeah, I understand what you're saying, and khalas, I'm, I cannot push you to change your opinion because this is your opinion. But again, if you have an opinion that you think is the right one, and you say it, and people don't like it, as a result of this, what will happen? Many bad things can happen. But the real ulama, they don't really care so much about the reaction of the people. They say what they believe is the truth. Whether people like it, don't like it, it's a different story. But if you have knowledge and you hide this knowledge, it's a great sin. Rasulullah said, Man katama ilman aljamahullahu bi lijamin min nar yawm al qiyamah. You know the lijam, the word lijam? You know the horse? They put this thing in between here to be able to control the horse. Okay? So this lijam of the, the one who has knowledge and he hid this knowledge, he did not distribute or share this knowledge with others. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will punish him in the day of judgment by putting this lijam of fire on his mouth because he did not speak, he did not say what needs to be done. It's a great responsibility. But say it. And whether people like it or not, it's a different story. And the third pressure now, I, I think, in the modern time, is the pressure of fame. Pressure that comes from the business. Because businessmen, they have their own TV stations and they, this website and they organize events. And many scholars, they have to say what the honor of this TV channel wants to say. Because he wants to get more commercials and more money and so on. So, scholars have to stay out of this pressure. And this is what these great Imams have achieved so far. That's why I believe, I believe, when I think about this, why these four Imams, why these only four schools, we could have had, you know, 10, 15, 20 schools of thought. It seems to me that, Wallahu alam, that these great Imam are still alive with us today, are still influential, because there was a secret between them and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Because of their sincerity, because of their truthfulness, because they did not exchange this knowledge with fame or money or wealth. It was for the sake of Allah. When we do something sincerely for the sake of Allah, it will stay alive. It will stay alive. If it is for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, it will flourish. It will never die. But if it is, it, there is something else like it's not 100%, it's like 98% or 90% or 50%, it will die quickly. It will not, not survive. It seems to me these great Imams are still receiving great reward every time we use their knowledge. It is because Allah subhanahu likes them. Allah loves them because they were sincere. Not only because they are great scholars, as I have seen. Many scholars said that there are many scholars even have more knowledge than Abu Hanifa and Malik and Shafi'i. But these people have more sincerity. That's why Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala kept their knowledge. Another important reason why these four schools of thought survived is simply because they had brilliant students who wrote this knowledge and spread this knowledge. This is how schools survive. When you have brilliant students, if you are a teacher, you have brilliant students who write your opinions and um, uh, issue fatwas based on them and teach them, right? Then this school flourishes and survives. But if you are a great, great scholar and people listen and listen and listen, they benefit from your knowledge, but nobody writes, nobody, you know, cares to organize these thoughts or write about the methodology of the Imam, it will be gone. It will die. When you die, it will survive maybe for maybe a few decades and then that's it. So these four scholars, 
or for schools of thought of Madahib, they survived because of these two things. I think, number one, because they have sincerity. They wrote it for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, as we will see about their ibadat and taqwa. And number two is because of their students, who write not only their fatawa, but also they wrote about the, 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 the methodology or the madhab of their imam. And it became a school of thought. It became a school of thought because once you go to a school in Al-Azhar, my father, for example, told me when he went to Al-Azhar, the, in the application, you have to fill, you choose one of the formula, which one have you want to study? And he said, at, at that time, we didn't read, you know, we were young students and we don't know. So we talked to each other, you know, to our parents and, you know. So they went to uh, one, one of the fathers of his uh, friends he said guys we just write Malik he said why he said, we, because Egyptians love Al Imam Shafi Al Imam Shafi is, is very influential in Egypt until now right they love him very much he died in Egypt but despite this emotional attachment to Imam Shafi they decided to be Maliki why is that because they heard that according to Imam Shafi if you just touch your wife like this your wudu is gone. You have to make another wudu. Even by accident, you know, you get something from the kitchen and you hit or you touch your wife shoulder to shoulder and once you, your skin touched her skin like this, your wudu is gone. No, 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 no. That's, that's too, <laughs> too difficult. Let's be Maliki. <laughs> and they decide based on this, right? But um, you choose one of these four. Of course, the Shia Muslims, they follow the Jafari madhab. Or the Zaydi Madhab. The Jafari, the mainstream Shias are Jafari or Ithna Ashari, they have different two, two names. Jafari uh, goes to Imam Jafar al Sadiq, who was also a great scholar for Sunnis. Also. Imam Jafar al Sadiq, the son of Muhammad al Bakr, Muhammad al Bakr and Jafar al Sadiq. Jafar al Sadiq uh, uh, is the founder of the Jafari Madhab. Zaydi, Zaydis uh, are only mainly in Yemen. Uh, the Zaydi uh, Shias uh, were very, very close from, from uh, Shafi's, actually. Um, there's no great difference between the two. Um, based on, on the mother of, of Zaid ibn, uh, ibn Ali, uh, rahimahullah, um, these are the f uh, six madhab, the four Sunni and the two Shias. In addition to this, you need also to know that there is another great madhab still it's not followed, but still studied. When I read fiqh, I also read their madhab. It's called the madhab al-zahiri. Madhab al-zahiri. Al-zahiri, the word zahiri, do you know what the word zahiri means? Yeah, zahiri, in, in knowledge we call it literal. What is the literal meaning of this? You go with the literal meaning with it. And of course, this goes against the Hanafi or the Ra, the people who use their intellect so much. So the Madhab of Zahiri established also in Iraq by Dawood and it flourished and it was theorized by Imam Abu Hazm, Ibn, sorry, Ibn Hazm, Ibn Hazm of Zahiri. And Imam Ibn Hazm of Zahiri. So Al Zahiri came as a result of the reaction to the blind or strict following of the Madhab. So people in Andalusia, in Spain today, were following either, and they were used to fight with each other, and he thought that the followers of the Madhahib, they went far away from the Quran and the Sunnah, and he said, you know what, let's stick to the literal meaning of the Quran and the Sunnah. What the Quran says, follow it. What the Sunnah says, follow it. That much. You know, you don't use analogy, you don't use this, you just... And there's a Madhahib called Madhahib Ibadi. I'm sure most of you don't hear about it. Madhab Ibadi is the madhab of the Kharijites, basically, which is only in Oman. You know, Oman, south of Saudi, uh, you know, next to Yemen, south of Saudi Arabia, uh, east of Yemen. Uh, this is called Madhab Al Ibadi, followed by a few number of people in, in Oman. Almost that's it. So the Zaidi in Yemen and Ibadi in Oman, and of course, it, it, the, the Ibadis or the Zaidis are everywhere in the world. There are Shia Zaidis here, but the main community is in, in Yemen. Um, these are the Madahib, Shafi'i, uh, Hanafi, Maliki, Shafi'i, Hanbali, Zahiri, 
Jafari and Ibadi. And sometimes, interestingly, you find all these seven madhab, they agree on something. And some fuqa said, according to the seven madhab, this is halal or haram or permissible or impermissible. So when you hear the word seven madhab, this is what, what they refer to. Can we or should we listen or read and study the Jafari madhab? Is everything in the Jafari madhab okay? Yes, we can and we should study it if we can. In Al-Azhar, recently, Al-Azhar, not very recently, I mean in the, in the 60s, last year, Sheikh Mahmoud Shatud, Sheikh Al-Azhar, he decided to add Al-Madhab al-Ja'fari. So the students of knowledge, they study the comparative fiqh um, and including Al-Madhab al-Ja'fari. Can we pray behind Shi'as? Yes, we can pray behind Shi'as. Absolutely. There's no doubt. Because the Ja'fari Madhab is based on a good methodology. It's, it goes all the way back to the Quran, the Sunnah, through Imam Ja'far al-Sadiq, who was a great Imam for Sunnis and for Shi'as. Everybody respects and loves Imam Ja'far al-Sadiq. So, so yes, in general, we can um, um, uh, pray behind uh, Ja'fari people, of course. Al-Mazhab al-Zahri, as I said, it's not followed by, by people, but it, is, it, is, it has very solid um, uh, opinions and, 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 and books, and we follow them when we, in research, for example, we quote them and their opinions in, 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 in academic research. I will stop here, inshallah, and if you have any questions, inshallah, uh, we'll stop with Abu Hanifa, we'll go this order, Abu Hanifa, Malik, Shafi'i, and Imam Ahmed. The what, ma'am? That's a good question. Did they recognize these four imams during their life or after? As I said, these imams and no one in their time thought that whatever they say will become a school of thought and the fiqh will end up in four school of thoughts. Nobody, and actually, as I said, many people dislike them during their life. In their life, uh, you know, we sometimes think when Imam Shafi'i walks in the streets, everybody stands up and greets Imam Shafi'i. Because Imam Shafi'i, he was not that great when he was alive. You know why? Because what he, what he produced is ideas. It's just ideas, opinions. And these opinions is one of tens of other opinions. You have Imam Shafi'i teaching in this masjid and great other Imams teaching in other masjid. So he's one of many. Yeah, people say he's brilliant, he's smart, but he's one of many. He's one of many. But when he died, people read his books and studied them and examined them and said, wow, his opinion is brilliant. Let's, let's Take it more seriously. Do you know that many Imams have brilliant opinions and ideas, but they did not write it down? Why? Because they said, you know, people will not like it, and I, I just want to be in, be in peace. But these Imams, they, they wrote about their opinions, they taught for years, and when they died, people said, wow. That, that's wonderful. Keep in mind, when we study the history of fiqh, very important to know the history of fiqh, the development of fiqh. This, the, the time between, uh, you know, 150 and, and 250, this was the golden age of fiqh. This is the time of the imma, Abu Hanifa, Malik, Shafi'i. This is the golden age of Islamic schools of thought. After this, and starting the fourth century, there was almost an agreement that if you want to study, you need to follow one of these four imams. So from the fourth century, you have to follow one of these imams. This is the age of taqlid. Taqlid means following. It's not the age of the brilliant imams, genius imams. Even if you are genius, you cannot establish a fifth. So the, the idea 
came out that you have to follow one of these four imams. This is Islam. To be a Muslim, you have to follow one of these four imams. So the schools of thought became four, and you study based on these four schools of thought. And we are still suffering from this notion until today. One of the main reasons why we are suffering intellectually is because they said no more ishtihad. We don't need more ishtihadi. They close the gate of ishtihad. You cannot be mujtahid. Even if you are mujtahid, you have to be mujtahid within the madhab. Okay? You can be mujtahid within the madhab. Not out of this four madhab. Do you think that's right or wrong? I believe that was a big mistake. When they claim that the gates of the ishtihad are closed and you have to be one of the followers, you have to follow. That's why we're, we're talking about Imam al-Ghazali. Al-Imam al-Ghazali al-Shafi'i. You have to put al-Shafi'i because he's Shafi'i. Right? Al-Imam al-Suyuti, in his name, or Imam Abu Abdullah, so and so, al-Suyuti al-Shafi'i. But Imam Suyuti himself is a, is a brilliant scholar. Imam Ghazali was one of the best minds in human history. Why Imam Ghazali was not independent Imam, a fifth Imam? Ibn Taymiyyah, he's Hanbali, right? Ibn Taymiyyah was also one of, the, one of the top great Imams. If you re just read the, 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 his books and fatawa, you wonder how long does it take for him to just to write? If someone, you know, tell him what to write. How much does it take for him to write all these books? In philosophy, in theology, in fiqh, in usul al-fiqh, in history? It's, it's amazing. You think this is the production of like 10 scholars, not just one. And he spent good time of his life in prison. Imam Taymiyyah. So why Imam Taymiyyah is, is Hanbali? Why Imam Ghazali is Shafi? These brilliant people, why they're not independent scholars? And they started their own school of thought. Because according to scholarship at that time, you have to be one of the four. That's it. You cannot start your own madhab. That was the understanding. That's it. Now, I will end with this. I know this can take for so long. Do we have to follow these four madahib or one of the madahib? Oh, let me rephrase the question. Do we here, American Muslims, can we afford to be only Hanafi, strictly Hanafi, or strictly Shafi, or strictly Hanbali or Maliki? The question is big no. You know why? You know why? Because I'm not saying we should reject all these. No, what I'm saying is we should honor and respect all these four and be selective. Because the life we are living today in America is totally different from the life that these great Imams lived. Because some believe that you have, if you have to choose, you have to choose from these four Imams. You cannot go beyond this. Okay, now, how about the new questions? How about the banking? How about the, this insurance? How about um, organ donation? How about um, sperm bank? All these questions never discussed in this form of that, right? Which means that we have to make our own ishtihad because there are new questions that these imams have never answered because these questions never existed. So we are living in a very complex world. If you want to be only Maliki in America, I'm so sorry. This can help in Ibadat, Witr, and Najasa, and Tahara, Wudu, and all these things. Fine. Ibadat, fine. I'm talking about Mu'amalat. Right? It's extremely difficult. Yes, we can seek help. We can use the methodology to produce new opinions. But we will not find these answers in this Madah. So, and these Imams, they made Ishtihad. And after a few years, they changed their ishtihad. Why? Because the situation changed. That's why Imam Shafi has two madhab. Always the ulama quote Imam Shafi. Imam Shafi's opinion in the old is so and so, and Imam Shafi's opinion in the new is so and so. What the old and new? The new, the old madhab established in Iraq, and the new madhab started established in Egypt. Ten years, two different places. That makes a huge difference. 
And that's why Imam Shafi, because he was a real scholar, he changed. Because the circumstances changed. The circumstances changed. What fits one community does not fit every community in the world. A very conservative society in Saudi Arabia, for example, full separation between men and women. This is the way before Islam, during Islam, after. This is the society. They don't tolerate seeing men and women sitting in one, in one place, even respectfully and, you know, even when a scholar comes to give a lecture, full separation. That fits this society perfectly well. And women has to cover their head, their, their, their face. In Yemen, for example, if a woman walked in the village uncovering her face, that's a big shame. And people say, well, what is this? What kind of woman is this? Because every woman in the village covers her face. If one is decided to go uncovering her face, that would be a big shame. That would bring shame to her, to her family, and to the entire tribe. But this, is, this cannot fit Muslims in Turkey. That's not the good way for Muslims in Turkey. They cannot live like this. They cannot live like this. So, if someone born and raised in Yemen became a scholar, and now he had to travel to Malaysia or Indonesia or Turkey. If he wants to give fatwa the same way he gives in Yemen, he will be in big trouble. Nobody will follow him. Well, thank you very much. We respect you. You just stay, to stay out of the way. It's not going to work. It's not going to work. One of the major problems we have is that one fatwa fits all. One fatwa fits. This is the absolute truth of Islam. This is Islam. All Muslims around the world must follow it. Wrong. It doesn't work this way. It does not work this way. Islam never said all people must follow this particular. That's why the idea of rigidity of Islam comes from. From our understanding. Not from Islam. Islam is extremely flexible. That's why. That's why. Because it's flexible. All people around the world like Islam. What's common between someone. A Muslim in Kenya. And a Muslim in Hyderabad. What's common between Muslim in Karachi and Muslim in Turkey? What's common between Muslim in, in um, Nigeria and Muslim in Yemen? There are huge differences. But what's common is the fundamentals of Islam. But you cannot go now in Africa and tell them all Muslim, all Muslim must cover their, 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 their face. You cannot tolerate it. You cannot take it. And that's the beauty of Islam. It's flexible, it recognizes the local culture, not to the point of, you know, replacing Islam with the culture, that's what I'm saying, but Islam fits well in every culture. Islam fits perfectly well with every culture. As long as we are preserving the fundamentals of Islam, praying five times a day and, and, and you know, and all these things, the clear halal haram things are observed, yes, then give the culture its own space. You cannot, you cannot force all people to wear the same clothes. And I don't, I don't like this idea of Islamic clothes. And people call this Islamic. I don't call this Islamic. I call it an Arab way of dressing. I feel comfortable with it. I like it. Not because it's Islamic. And Shirwal Kamis, I don't call it Islamic. I call it nice, cool, but it was introduced in India and Pakistan and nowhere else in the Muslim world. People wear shirwal kameez the way we do. That's made in China, by the way. <laughs> and I won't say that every, all this clothes you're wearing is Islamic. It's not only this is Islamic. Right? The culture cultural aspect is there. And the ulama understand this. That's why Imam Shafi changed from Iraq to Egypt. More knowledge, more information, meeting more scholars, going from one society to another. He changed. Within this methodology, it's not like a rock solid thing. But this methodology also can subject to change. And that's why I have new madhab. Because they were flexible. And they understand Islam is flexible. It is we. Sometimes we think Islam is so rigid and that's it. This is the pure understanding of Islam. Everything else is wrong. So there, were no, there was no designation at that time 
There's no authority or political authority that says these are the full imams you have to follow. This came sin, uh, uh, almost a century and a half after, in the fourth century, when the ulama at that time said, okay, no more ishtihad, you either um, you follow one of these four madhaib and that's it. Our situation or our position from this madhaib is great respect, not to the point of turning them into prophets. They are humans. Their opinions can fit well in some situations and cannot fit well in other situations. Yes? It is the, 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 it is the orf or the custom of the scholars at that time. It's, it's developed this way. When these schools of thought were developed and people start, it's like it became the magnetic force. Okay, so if you study philosophy, you have to choose one of the school of thought of philosophy, right? If you study, and this became four, and this khalas, you know what? You cannot more, be more brilliant than these four, just be one of these four. It was like custom, it's a, the, the, the conventional understanding among scholars at that time. And by the way, by the way, this, um, there is a debate between the scholars if this was the truth, of the, of, of, of the ulama after that, but some ulama, as I mentioned, great, brilliant, and they disagreed with their imams. But again, it is ijtihad within the madhab, not ijtihad out of the madhab. Right? Well, this, this is the business of the scholars, not the individuals. Scholars who make ijtihad in one mas'ala, for example, when you study the concept of wali, that the woman has to have a garden, father, uncle, grandfather, and things like that. Three said, yes, it must be one, which is Abu Hanifa said, no, the woman, if she's mature enough, she can conduct her marriage perfectly fine without the approval of her guardian, wali, right? So it is the scholars who decide this or in a particular situation here. For example, sometimes it comes to me, you know, couples want to get married. And the girl is like 25 years old and she just new convert and her entire family is not Muslims. I always ask, did your family approve this marriage? It's not a must, but it's always better for the family to be happy, to be involved. No. They disliked me. When, once I converted to Islam, they boycotted me. And they, so in this case, should I tell it? No, you have to bring a wali. Okay, all my family are Christians or Jews or atheists and they hate me because of Islam. No, but I'm Shafi. I'm so sorry, I'm Shafi. You have to have a wali. Or where, where can I find this wali? Walmart or where can I get this wali from? Oh, the book says you have to have a wali. But we are living in a different situation. We are living in America. All these books of fiqh were written in the time when Muslims were dominating, you know, Muslims are powerful, we have majority Muslims and things. Now this girl, how, how can I get her married now? You know what some imams do? They do something that's very silly. Very silly. They say, okay, you know, go and find someone from the community to become your wali. So, brother, can you be my wali? Yeah, okay, can you please come with me? Okay, he's your wali? Yeah. Would you uh, agree that she married this person? Yes, okay, khalas, alhamdulillah. Now we solve the problem. What is this? Now, if I'm a strict Shafi'i, in this particular situation, I must be Hanafi. As an Imam, I should be Hanafi. Okay, and ask her, okay, do you accept this person and things? Well, the marriage is done. Why? Because Imam Abu Hanifa said that she can make it. And he made it based on very valid points. All right? So, this flexibility, I think it's up to the Imams and scholars, uh, not up to individuals. For the layman, the individuals, uh, the scholars almost agreed on, on, on this. Al Ami If you are if you are not one of the scholars, you have no madhab, basically. Your madhab is the madhab before Mufti. 
Again, when it comes to ibadat, how to pray and how to fast, these things, that's okay, it's fine. You are following this uh, madhab or, or so. But I'm talking about what's, what's beyond ibadat. Mu'amalat, transactions, business, marriage, and divorce, and custody, and, and, and so on. You have no madhab. You are in the airplane, flying. Okay? And you don't know how to pray. And you find someone that you think, oh, this is the Imam, so on, so let's go and ask him. Oh, Imam, now how, how, should, how should we pray now? You make wudu and you sit down in your chair and pray. Okay, go. Don't ask him what's your madhab. You're on the airplane. You need a fatwa. You find someone that you know is a good Imam and is, you know, with good reputation. Ask him whatever he tells you, go and pray. And do it. Do what he says. Your madhab is the madhab of your mufti. But your mufti, I mean the mufti you're asking. If you travel somewhere, if you have, if, it ha if you got a good contract in Morocco, and you want to work in Morocco, where everybody there is Maliki, you're going to pray according to Maliki, believe me. Every masjid you'll enter, you'll pray according to Maliki, madhab. You have no choice. Okay, and you have an issue. You divorce your wife, while you are angry, you are going to go to the madhab, to, to the masjid in Morocco. You are going to ask the imam there, Imam, I divorced my wife while I was angry, right? Whatever fatwa gives you, take it. Because he's your mufti. All right? If you get a good job in, 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 in Yemen, then you'll be shafi. Go and ask the imam and whatever. If you are doing umrah, and you don't know what to do, you've done something wrong or done. Go to one of these booths and ask the sheikh there, Mufti, I did this, what should I do? It happened with me, by the way. It happened with me. I decided to make Quran, Hajj Quran, like one ihram, right? I came from Medina to Mecca on the um, 8th. So, and the plan was to make Umrah quickly and take the bus and go to Mina and then Arafat. So one ihram. One ihram. Okay, you are not going to take off the ihram of Umrah and stay a few days and then put on new ihram. So I came to Mecca and I made the Umrah and after the sa'a between Safa and Mora because I've never done Quran before. I always make either Umrah alone or Umrah and then Tamattu and then Hajj. So every time I used to make Tawaf and Sa'i and after Sa'i I go and shave. This is what I do all the time. And I forgot. I'm in Ihram. So after the Sa'i, I went and shaved. <laughs> oh my God. Now, my, I, you cannot shave while you're in Ihram. Right? But I just forgot. I thought that's the Umrah. And the Umrah will be gone. And then you'll make a new Ihram. But on my way to the hotel, I said, oh my goodness. My niya is to have Quran. And now I shaved. I shouldn't have shaved. I didn't know what to do. From what I studied, when you do something by mistake to violate the ihram, you either uh, do dam, the biha, or if you forgot and you do this out of forgetting, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will forgive this because you did not intentionally do it. You forgot. Like you are fasting and sometimes you go and drink something and you forget your fasting. And you drink. What happens? Most of the ulama said, Khalas, that, that's, that's forgiven because you did not this intentionally. So I had these two opinions. Dumb or no dumb. Dumb means like $350. And nothing is much cheaper. <laughs> and I said, I'm not going to make fatwa for myself. I'm going to someone else. Whatever he tells me, I will do it. I went to this one of these booths, although this is a totally different school of thought from mine. You know, can talk more about this. But I said because it's, it's my situation, I don't want to give fatwa to it because I was more inclined to it's for, forgiven because you made it by mistake. So you know, whatever he tells me, I'm going to do it. Okay? If he told me sacrifice, I will sacrifice. If he told me nothing, nothing. I'll be comfortable. Khalas. And before I go, actually I asked someone who was uh, with us and he said, you know what? If this is the first Hajj you're making, don't take a chance. Make Hajj, because this is the Hajj of Islam, one of the pillars of Islam. 
take the extreme measure and do them. And I decided to go and ask one of these uh, uh, muftis the Saudi government put in different stations, and I told him about this. And he told, uh, he told me, according to our mother, you feed 10 misakeen. Okay, he said, he said it's, if you did my mistake, there's nothing but it's better to feed 10 poor people. I said, alhamdulillah. I went to this, uh, one of these uh, fast food things that have rice and have chicken and things and water. I told him, get me 10 meals, please. He got these 10 meals, and I went, gave it to people around the haram that I think they are poor. And I did what he told me, just stay out of this. So your madhab is the madhab of the person that gives you fatwa, basically. سبحانك اللهم وبحمدك نشهد أن لا إله إلا أنت نستغفرك ونتوب إليك بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم والعصر إن الإنسان لفي خسر إلا الذين آمنوا وعملوا الصالحات وتواصوا بالحق وتواصوا بالصبر سبحان ربك رب العزة عما يصفون وسلام على المرسلين والحمد لله رب العالمين